take a moment and make sure you're prepared. Heavenly Father, what a great privilege it is to be part of this church, to be associated with these believers. Hungry, hungry believers that are growing in grace. We may get stalled along the way, Father. We may just get distracted by knowledge. But I pray that you bring that which we need in our life to, to bump us along and get us going again. Get us moving to the high ground of maturity and beyond and to service for the Lord. I pray, Father, that in order for that to happen, we have to have stable marriages and good marriages. It's out of that good marriage that your, your ministry actually flows. I mean, to preach Christ and have a bad marriage, an angry, fighting, stand, you know, detente marriage, is, it shows hypocrisy. I think it's what's part of the church's problems today is we say one thing, but we don't have the strength, the power, the knowledge, the understanding to do, to do what we say. And so it's empty. It's just another propaganda system. I pray, Father, that we in this community could be genuine, genuine Christian lives. I pray it in his name. Amen. All right. I like these little quotes. Truth does not mind being questioned, whereas a lie does not like being challenged. And that's a lot of what you see today in, in our media and our social media. Uh, I would encourage you, I would encourage you to stop listening to mainstream media if you do. All right. Philippians chapter 3. This is, we're going to talk about selfishness and humility, and this is in relationship to relationships. The title of this message is Using Conflict, and I'm, sp I'm really focused on marriage, but this is any relationship. If you're not married, you have relationships, you have conflicts. What are they for? Using conflict to develop compatibility. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or baseless pride or pretense, but with humility of mind, conclude, and these are my words, I, I, my interpretation, but conclude and visualize one another is more important than yourself. Now, how do you do that? How do you, be, how do, you do that honestly? Well, you do it as best you can before it's real, and you keep growing until it is real, but... I want to talk, I want to compare today, I want to introduce this and compare today selfishness and humility, all right? First of all, hmm, I think John sent the, I got John's old version of this. First of all, Adam's sin has caused everything and everyone to be corrupted by selfishness and self-centeredness. Do you understand that in your initial way of thinking in life that you're very selfish and very self-centered and it's a me-centered way of thinking. You know, as I said, my Christian life used to be, what's in this for me? What can God do for me? And then one day he made me see that what's really, that, that he wasn't here for me to make my life work. I was here for him to make his plan work. And that's when I began to be able to, to give in the more personal parts of my life, when I realized it's, this is not about getting, me getting what I want. The big lie, Ephesians 4.22, we're, we're corrupted and deceived by deceitful desire. The, the, the lie of, of bad, the lie that we believe that we connect to our desire is if I can get what I want, what will that mean? If I can get what I want. I mean, everybody wants, and everybody thinks if I can get what I want, I'll be happy. Did you know that's not true? Don't pursue happiness. Pursue godliness. Pursue meaning and purpose, and happiness will result. Happiness is a result. You can't make it happen. You can't pursue it. You can't find it. You can't catch it. You can't capture it. 
It's a result of getting rightly oriented to God. And a big part of that for this, for our life is our relationships. Everything's about, everything's relationship. You know, all this, if you strip this thing away, it would just be the, the souls relating to one another. That's what this is. So we begin our life and usually our marriage, self-centered and selfish. What can this person do for me? Here's what the Bible says. Why aren't you doing these things? You know, the Bible says you're supposed to be this and that and that. And that's what I'm expecting. And therefore, I am expecting and demanding that you do that for me and give me that. That's how we begin. That's marriage counseling. And, and Rhonda and I, we've done a ton of it now. Uh, you know, she's doing this. He's doing that. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. He's doing this instead. Well, how is it that you can give to encourage to edify in that situation? Oh, it's not about me edifying. It's about me getting what I want. See, that's the lie. So we begin selfish. We believe the myth that marriage is, prim is the primary source for happiness. That's a, that's a big myth in America life anyway, in modern life, that a romantic love relationship is what everybody has to have to be happy. What that really is is idolatry, where your faith and hope and love is connected to a human being. And they're supposed to act in such a way that, oh, now I feel happy. That's a big lie. That doesn't work that way. That is not God's plan. Nobody's going to make you happy. Not even God unless you get lined up properly. So, self-centeredness causes us to expect and demand that our mate or our friend totally fulfill their biblical role right now. Right now. Why aren't you doing what you said you would do? We took these vows and you said you would do this and this and this. And you're not doing that. At the same time, demanding that they be excused for not being able to fulfill our... Is that your phone dinging? Would you turn that dinger off for me? Thank you. I would submit if my husband loved me like Christ. So she's relating conditionally. Yeah, I will do that. If he does his part, I'll do my part. Give to get back. I would be more patient if my wife, with my wife if she would cooperate more with me instead of arguing with me about everything. Yeah, if she were to do her part, you know, okay, now I'll do my part. When you attach your need and hunger for love, for connection to your mate primarily and God secondarily, call it idolatry, it drives us to demand that they deliver steady love and affirmation. Sorry, that's a help, Mark. What is that? My blue coat, my scooter. Sorry about that. I can't turn it off. You need <laughs> Let's pray for Chris right quick. Father, I pray that you will stabilize his body and his insulin. And uh, help him to be healthy, Father. He's a good man. We love him. And we, we just pray for him in Christ's name. All right. When you attach your need, your hunger, and your desire for love, for acceptance, connection to your mate more than God, it drives us to demand that they deliver steady love and affirmation. This is the reason you got married in the first place, was to get this steady love and affirmation. Right? You didn't get married to become somebody who gave unconditionally, no matter what you got back from that person. You didn't get married to do that. That's because you got married in an, with an earthly mindset about it. I'm going to give to her or give to him, and he's going to give back to me. That's how this is supposed to work. And let me tell you, it don't work that way. And everybody who's still trying to work it that way is struggling with it. 
Everybody who's trying to work, you're not giving to me, and I, you're not giving to me, and I'm not getting what I need, and blah, blah, blah. If that's, if that's still your relational uh, approach, listen, it's very difficult. We program ourselves that with the first part of our life. It's very difficult to get out of that. I'm definitely, I'm not fussing at that. I'm saying, I'm trying to show you and point out why do we keep struggling so much? Well, because you think you're supposed to get what you need from that person. And the truth is that person doesn't have most of what you need. They don't have it. Even if they wanted to give it to you, they don't have it. So you're like, I was going to say leeches, but maybe that's a good analogy. So, we grow, as immature believers, we imagine ourselves as dependent on what our mate does or doesn't do. In other words, if, if what your mate does or doesn't do totally controls how you feel, then you're in this trap. It's a trap. We grow out of this selfishness into the capacity to surrender ourselves to the Lord, enabling us to be the marital partner described in the scriptures. You grow into that role. They grow into that role. The question is, are you growing into that role? Are you working to improve yourself in your relationship with the Lord? And that role naturally begins to improve. Is that what you're doing? Are you growing into the person that God designed you to be? Because the, th the commands of marriage, the Christian marriage in the Bible are beyond human capacity. Love your wife like, like Christ loves you, son. Well, how does Christ love me? He never reacts. He never gets mad. He never is negative. He's never angry with him. He's always loving, nurturing, encouraging, and pushing me, helping me, you know, correcting me. He's always doing what is good for me. That's what that means. I only do what is good for others. No harm. If I get angry, if I get frustrated, that hurts the people I love. I don't know how many people I've talked to whose marital struggles and the anger that ensued during those marital struggles confused their children. The children are now trying to grow up and have relationships and they're like, I don't know what in the world is true. How is this supposed to work? All I've ever seen is fighting and fussing. And I don't really want that. So it's no wonder that the number of marriages has dropped. Number of children has dropped. You know, in the 60s when the, everything went crazy, the sexual revolution and, you know, all the divine standards got thrown out the window and this, you know... <clears throat> 60 years later, the, the American family has dissolved, just dissolved, because people don't understand how or are not willing to grow in the Lord. They don't get taught. I don't believe we're the only church that teaches God's Word, and I don't believe that at all. I think that's ridiculous. I think this church is trying to teach it and provide it for people to grow as best we know how. Probably others that do it better. But the people that teach here, we just, this is the best we know, the best we have. We're just trying to help you, encourage you, develop you. And you just give what you've been given. So, selfishness is what kills every relationship in your life. So we grow out of it into the capacity to see, and you don't, you don't surrender to your partner, you give it to, you surrender to the Lord. Why, should, Lord, that lady, why should I go and love her like you love me, like Christ loves her? Why should I do that? Because that's what I told you to do, son. And if you'll do that, at least you'll be doing your part at least I'll be pleased with you. 
How about that? Is that not enough? Well, I would like it to be enough, Lord, but I still, I still want something from this. Well, how about if you do your part? Truly enter into doing your part. Commit to it. Give all your heart into it. I believe you might see something come out of that. I believe you might see things start to get a little better. You do your job, like I told you. I believe you'd see something start to get a little better. See, you come out of your selfishness and you're demanding this and give to me, give to me. Do it my way. It's got to be my way. Controlling. I'm teaching a study tonight at 5 o'clock online. You're certainly invited. The study is about Rebecca and how she took control out of fear that Jacob wasn't going to have everything he needed, everything she wanted for him. She saw it about to go by the wayside, so she took control. And she created a scam, a lie. And she destroyed her family. Twin boys, and she chose her favorite over... You think Esau ever trusted her again? If you know the story? I bet not. His wife said, hey, let's go see your mama. <laughs> He's like, you know, watch for the knife in your back. Now... The biblical man commands and roles described in marriage and in relationships are a mission from God. They're a mission from God. You see the Blues Brothers movie? We're on a mission from God. Look, in your marriage, you're on a mission from God. This is not about you. It's not about you getting what you need. God will give you what you need. You're on a mission. Listen, and you're important. You're necessary for all of this to work God's way. You are important. Your marriage is important. For this church, for God's ministry in this community, your marriage is critical and important. Not just for you and for your kids, but for the Lord and the mission. You're on a mission to love that woman, nurture her, edify her, Help her develop and grow. Surround her with protection as much as you're able. And ladies, you're on a mission through your cooperative spirit and your submission to this husband to show him the love and grace of God. These roles are not just about you getting along in a human manner in your human life. These roles in the Bible are not about your human life. First of all, it's a, it's a metaphor for Christ in the church. But the roles to love like Christ and to surrender and submit to the Lord, to, to give that to your husband, that's a mission from God. It's not about what you want or how you feel or he said this and she said, it's not about that. You're on a mission. Now, the question is, are you going to take your mission seriously? Are you going to do your mission? That's going, to, that's going to be the question of your life. There'll be others later, maybe, but that's going to, right now, that's going to be the question of your life. Are you going to do your mission in your marriage or in your close relationship? Are you going to do your mission? Now, I don't, I'm not speaking to somebody who's hardly ever done that, but I see it. I understand it, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm committed to it, and I'm going to do it. Nothing can stop me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it best I know how. I'm going to be that person. And, 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 and we can do that. You can do that. You, you, that's, that's what the Spirit's for. That's what the, all this doctrine, holy smokes, that's so you can become the person that God can work through. God's love can flow through you. Not just his truth. So, marriage improves as people improve. That's not kind of sensible, isn't it? By growing less selfish, less fearful, less defensive, less angry, less reactionary. When you're selfish, you exaggerate your legitimate needs and desires. Listen, it's not wrong to want your mate to give to you. Of course we want that. 
But when you make it the when you make it the most important thing, it just you can't do anything else in your life. So we exaggerate legitimate needs and desire. We believe our need is the most important issue in the universe. God, why aren't you here making my husband act right? What you want is usually a legitimate need and desire. But listen, you got to learn to surrender to the Lord and let Him give that to you. Because He will. Are you defensive? Have you built these self-protective walls because you've had so many disappointments and so many hurts? Can't be vulnerable and connect. Nobody can get to you. Your soul's walled off. You live like that. Your fear of not being worthy to be loved or being hurt or failing or not measuring up. These are called strongholds. Paul says those things got to get torn, torn down. Got to tear that down. That's not from God. And you listen, strongholds, where you're protecting yourself, you're hiding in something. You can't, you can't, you can't, the Lord can't express His love through you. Very little. It just sort of squeaks out around your walls. If at all, you've got to tear that down so love can flow through you. Not just to your mate, but to the world. Are you reactionary? We allow our hurt, fear, and anger to well up in us so that we explode. And then we withdraw. We get silent. We draw, you know, we, 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 we build a wall over here and we just live our own little life. Angry, hurtful words, accusations, quarrels, threats, name calling. So as you grow spiritually into the Lord, if you look at the bottom of the page, we become less needy and self-centered. You start as a baby believer, you go to be, you grow, you're on a journey, listen. Mm, how did I say that? You're, you're on a trajectory, on a path that you've chosen inside of a journey with a destination. And whatever path you're choosing, moment by moment by moment, day at a time, you're choosing God, choosing God, choosing God, staying in the Spirit, staying in the Spirit. I'm going to love, I'm going to give, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to, I'm going to be edifying. That's a path. It's a path that you habituate. And you grow, the more you do it, the more you're able to do it. The more it's easier to do it, the stronger you get. It's called momentum. But if your path is facing the hardship, because see, you've got to push against yourself to do that. But if the path is like, no, can't do it now. No, I'm still going to react. No, I'm still going to be angry. I'm not letting my anger go. I'm not going to forgive. I'm not going to. So here's your other path. The godly path leads to a really good place. In your marriage, in your life, the other path, the reactionary path, the, the, the defense, self-defensive, the self-protected path, the me, me, me path, whew, it destroys families. It's what's happened to our country. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. And, and, and a lot of you are past this point in life, but it's still important. It's still part of, you see... You say, well, my kids are up and gone. I don't, I, you know. Listen, you're still, you're still part of this whole picture. The, your kids are gone. You're not excused. Well, we're old now and we're, you know, we're still able to give some and show, we show up and we love to hear the word and we love our friends and everything, but no, 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 no. Man, we're on a mission. This, we're, this, this is get, about to get intense. This is about to get wacko crazy. You got to get you got to get ready. You got to be. You got to get your momentum going. Or you're going to get squashed. And listen, for you with young families and young kids and everything, you're going to lose your kids. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose your marriage, and you're going to hate that. Going to hate it. So, you grow from self-centered to God-centered, human agenda to divine agenda, being anxious and fearful to confident and peaceful. Let's take some mental action steps here. Humility. 
you admit that you're not yet the person God designed you to be. Now, this is, this is what you want to do. You say, well, all right, I hear you. You're describing me, describing my marriage. What do I do? The first thing you do is change the belief. This is called taking off and putting on. The belief is that my mate is supposed to be fulfilling all the biblical commands the way I see them supposed to be played out now. And if he or she's not doing that, they're defective and I'm not happy. That's a belief. That's a belief that it should be that way. That God designed it that way. But he didn't design it that way. He designed us to grow into these roles. To help each other grow into these roles. So, you sit yourself down and you say to yourself, I'm not yet the person God designed me to be. Why do I expect him to be the God, the person God decided, designed him to be right now? Or I can't be happy with him. I can't be relaxed. I can't let go. I can't quit judging. I can't, re- I can't quit criticizing. I can't quit trying to change it. <laughs> See, when you think that you have to have everything working the way you want, you keep trying to change it. And the other person's like, quit trying to change me. You can't change another person's mind by what you say or do. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. They have to change. You create an environment in which you're with them that is fostering and developing and encouraging. and You let them do it themselves. They have to do it. Hardest thing about kids. They get to a point where you have to start letting them do it. They got to they gotta do themselves. They got to fly from the nest. If you're holding on to their leg, they can't fly. Or you keep trying to help, help them. Come on. You know, they got to flap. So, admit that you're not yet the person God designed you to be, the person you want to be, that you could be, and hopefully you're going to be. You're not that person yet. Or are you? Have you arrived? Me neither. This is the necessary step for developing humility that lets you see your own flaws so that you can be forgiven by the Lord, forgive others, forgive yourself, and change your unhealthy patterns. You have to realize that the only person that's in question in this relationship between me and the Lord is me. Not her, not him. This is you and the Lord. So the third page is that question that says, how are you doing with that? Are you listening to him? Are you learning from him? Are you trying to give yourself to him? Are you trying to surrender? Are you just out for me? Me, me, me. You have to see, you recognize that like all of us, I'm a sinner, you have flaws, unhealthy patterns resolved by spiritual growth just like everybody else, just like your partner. Be willing to receive feedback about specific habitual relational patterns. Things that you do consistently that aren't helpful to the relationship. Why would you not want to hear about that? If you're doing something consistently that's a habit for you, and maybe you don't even know you're doing it, but it's hindering and hurtful to, this, to your partner, to you, someone you love, why wouldn't you want to, them to say, hey, when you do that, It feels like this. But very few people are willing to hear that. Don't say that to me. All I want to hear from you is good stuff. Tell me how great I am, how pretty I am, how much you love me, how much you... Don't tell me the truth. I can't handle the truth. Every time I preach, I think of movies. What's that movie with... Oh... You can't handle the truth. Tom Cruise and Nicholson. So we have to fight. We have to uh, be aware of self-deception. I can't admit that I'm weak, needy, and flawed. I can't do it. I can't do it. That I fail and yet demand my partner to be pleased with me just the way I am. I, 
I, I'm kind of a wreck, but I want you to be happy with me just the way I am. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to work on myself. I'm not going to improve. I'm not going to surrender to the Lord. I'm not going to grow. But you married me. And now you've got to be happy with me the way I am. Does that sound silly? You know how I learned this stuff? Looking at me. This is me. This is me. Pretense. How about pretense? Wearing a mask of constructive beliefs and behaviors, the public self, designed to make us appealing to others so they can meet our hunger and thirst, protect us from disapproval, hatefulness and rejection. Who here today is, is in the way that you present yourself is the way that you actually are when it's just you and the Lord? Who is real? Now, I'm not suggesting that we lay our flaws and faults out in the floor here, but I'm saying who's, re who's, re who's wearing a mask and who's not wearing a mask? Who's putting on the face and who's not putting on the face? Who's vulnerable? Who's transparent? Who is able to interact in a loving way and let people see, man, I don't, I don't have it together either. I'm working on it. Hey, you want to work on it together? Let's work on it together. Let's help each other. Let's tell each other the truth about what's going on so that we can be real and be honest. Look, is that a dream? Did I have a, a dream somewhere that people could actually be like that? Because it don't happen very much. It's not very, very many people that are, that are open to go, look, tell me what you see. What do you see in me? What do you get from me? You know, because we want to, we got the mask on. We're trying to present ourselves so that we can be, get approval. How about projection, blaming and accusing others of practicing the very behaviors we refuse to see in ourselves? <laughs> Forget my, I, I'm not going to say the political. There seems to be a, a group of people in our nation right now that are really, really good at that. So, the goal is to surrender yourself, to commit to God, commit yourself to consistently surrender to the truth by embracing your adversities and conflicts. They are designed, listen, the conflicts are designed to help you. I only got, listen, let's go to that. Go to the, go to the last point, point three down there. In Christian marriage, conflict is your friend. When viewed through divine viewpoint, we hate conflict in marriage. We don't think it's good. We think it some, means something's wrong. It does mean that. But what we, we don't realize is God allows it so that we can see what's wrong and then fix what's wrong. With the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God, we can fix what's wrong with us. You don't have to stuff it all down and just rebound. Your life is just one rebound after the, after the next, and you never, you never work on anything or change anything. You never look at yourself in honesty. You never look at what you're believing and how you're acting and thinking. And Marital conflict, first of all, I've got four things that conflict is good to help you. It, it exposes selfishness and ungodly patterns of relating. It shows you where you're focused on you and not on growth. So, Rhonda and I conflict. You know, if, if I'm walking in the Spirit and I stay in the Spirit, instead of reacting, I look at, I ask the Lord, all right, show me how I'm contributing to that. What am I doing? What am I thinking? And what I believe I should get from her that I'm not getting. What am I telling myself that she should be doing that she's not doing that's causing me to be frustrated? Because, see, listen, that's what I'm saying may even be actually technically biblically true. But it's not there yet. 
she's not there yet. I'm not there yet. This is how you see. I'm not, we're not there yet. The conflict reveals it. You go, well, what, what is my part? What am I doing that's, that's hindering her? What is she doing that's hindering me? What are we doing that's not... See, those are, those are beliefs and thoughts and patterns and behaviors that are not from God. The goal is to get everything in your soul and your life to be beliefs and thoughts and ideas and patterns that are from the Lord. That's how you become like Christ. So when conflict comes, it shows me I'm not doing this right. I'm not thinking about this right. I'm not seeing this properly. Because if I were Jesus, he wouldn't be reacting this way. So I'm expecting something, believing that I should get something or not get something that's not real. It's a fantasy. I have a fantasy marriage. That's what most people have. They have this fantasy marriage of what it's supposed to be. And they never actually accept and become real about what it really is. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do. To do. So use conflict to, to look at your own selfishness. <laughs> Marital conflict reveals differences between partners. There are some things that are only handled by compromise. There's difference in male and female. If you don't understand that females are different than males, of course, everybody says that's not true anymore. Uh, that's, that's just a made-up thing. It's designed to destroy the family, destroy kids. It's trying to destroy kids. Simple as that. It's the devil. So there's differences. Okay, she's a female, and so she has needs different than mine. She wants her stuff around her. She wants her surroundings to look... A woman wears her house like she wears her clothes. Her property, her grounds, her house, her clothes. This is her apparel. And she's got to have it right. She does her hair, does her makeup. She wants to look right. This is a woman. And she needs to have that. As much as you're able to help her have that. Now he's a male. What does he need? Well, if he, he's an extrovert. He likes, to be, he likes to have fun. He's outgoing, blah, blah, blah. Or he's quiet. He needs some time by himself. Okay. Those are just differences. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Compromise. If you're not willing to compromise, you say, I'm going to stay down here and play this video game all night long. And I don't care what y'all are doing. That's just what I do. Because I'm me and I'm so important. Can't make it work that way. Thirdly, marital conflict and outside adversities offer each believer the opportunity to apply divine problem solving that honors God, proves the sufficiency of His Word to overcome the devil's world. Listen, marital conflict is when God has put you in the game. I need you to get a hit. We need you to get a hit. I need you to make a block. I need you to make a run. But God put you in the game. And he says, I need, you to, I need you to show that my word through the ministry of the Spirit will overcome all the problems of the devil's world. I'm more powerful than the devil's world. And you're my visual aid of that. Finally, i got to quit. I'm over time. Marriage conflict and adversities give you opportunities to not only apply the Word, but listen, to build momentum in applying the Word. You do it again and again and again and again, and before you know it, you've built up this head of steam, and it becomes your habit of life. Well, Father, I hope these things are helpful, just common sense, biblical ideas. I pray that if there's conflict in our marriages in this church, that you would work in their lives, that you would comfort them and encourage them and correct them and do what needs to be done, Father. I ask that you encourage them to pray that you would do what they need to straighten them out, to get them on the right path. We ask all that in Christ's name. Amen.